All right, so as the cow is saying, I am Matthias Stern, and I'm going to be giving an intro to MongoDB. So before I get started, can everybody in the back read this line? OK. Higher. OK. Let's see what I can do here. Better? Cool. All right. <clears throat> so just to get a feel for the audience, um, how many of you have heard of MongoDB before you saw the schedule? Excellent. Um, how many of you have tried MongoDB, even just like a demo? OK. And uh, how many of you are in production? A few of you, OK. Um, but it looks like there's a, about a majority that haven't even tried it. So I think I'm going to stick to more introduction um, rather than going into like some crazy deep features. But um, hopefully I'll give you a good taste of the database. Um, is anybody really hoping for a lot of slides today? Good. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm a programmer. Um, that's what I do. I also give talks. But my main job is a programmer. So I prefer to work with code and to show off code. Um, are, are most people in the audience also developers? Or are, is it mostly ops? Looks like it's any ops guys? All right, sorry, you're the majority, or minority. So. Um, I'm going to focus more on development. All right, so anyway, to get started, um, just to show you um, how to get started with Mongo, um, basically all you have to do is make a data directory. Um, by default, we use slash data slash db, but you can use any, um, any path you want and just specify it on the command line uh, or in a config file. And then you just start the database. Um, run MongoD. Um, if you specify master, that sets you up for replication. Um, if there were a few more ops people in the audience, I might uh, demo it. Um, but uh, that just sets you up for replication, and now you're ready to go. So I've got my database, um, and then you start the shell by running the mongo command. And from there, um, what I've done is I've went ahead and loaded this file so that you don't have to sit here and watch me type very slowly. Um, and I've got this. Um, so now I can just call any function I want from there. <clears throat> and the first one I decided to do was this little calsay thing. Um, if you're not familiar, the calsay command on uh, Unix is pretty nifty for things like this. Um, so um, <clears throat> I think I'll go ahead and start with uh, CRUD. Everyone knows CRUD, the create, retrieve, update, delete, you know, the, the basic things that everyone likes to do with the database. So um, I'll go ahead and run this function, and then we'll go through line by line and see what it's doing. So is there anyone in the audience that doesn't know what a blog is? Good. So um, this is going to be a very, very simple um, blog-like application. So just to walk through what's going on here, um, I've created a post. And this is um, basically JSON. It's, uh, it's using JavaScript syntax to build a JavaScript object. Um, typically, um, when you're working with Mongo, you'll be doing it from a language other than JavaScript, um, unless you're working in Node.js, I guess. But um, typically, you'll be working in Python, Java, C Sharp, Ruby, any of these languages. Um, and the syntax is somewhat similar, um, especially in languages that have an object literal syntax that looks something like this. Um, in Java, if you're unfortunate enough to be using that, um, you actually have to, you know, call all of these functions to add things because, you know, Java doesn't like syntax. So, um, but anyway, the basic data model is the same. So it's just inserting JSON objects. And to do that, you just call db.posts.save. And so what this is doing is taking the db object and hanging off of the db object are any collections. And so here I'm inserting into the post collection and I'm saving the post object. Um, and then the next line is just going to print it. Um, print JSON does pretty printing with, you know, putting things on multiple lines and making it look pretty nice. So anyway, um, this is what actually got inserted. And uh, so one thing to note is that it has all the fields just as I had written them. Um, another thing to note is that it added this underscore ID field. Now, this underscore ID field is the primary key. Um, you can put whatever you want there, but it has to be called underscore ID. And it gets used internally in a lot of places, and it will automatically have an index. 
Now, one nice thing about this object ID format, which uh, I'll repeat again, you're not required to use. You can use strings. You can use, um, you can use really whatever you want. You could use numbers if you wanted to. Um, but this has a couple of nice properties. So the, the, the format that we actually use is a four-byte timestamp, a three-byte um, uh, hash of the machine uh, host name, two bytes for the PID, and then a three-byte incrementing counter. I didn't actually count those out uh, while I was highlighting, but that's the, the gist of it. And um, it has a few nice properties. It's actually very similar, um, if anybody has read about Twitter's Snowflake ID. It's a very similar design. However, they had to fit into 64 bytes for legacy reasons, uh, sorry, 64 bits, whereas we were able to extend out to 12 bytes. So it's a little smaller than a UUID, but a little larger than a 64-bit int. Um, but what's really nice is because we have that um, timestamp at the very front, that means that your IDs are going to be sorted roughly by um, insert time. Additionally, you can get the created at time out of the, um, <clears throat> out of the ID. And so I'm showing that right here, um, post.id.getTimestamp. So you can see that it was created at this time, UTC. Um, <clears throat> so now, that's great for creating, but it wouldn't be a very useful database if I couldn't update anything. So um, perhaps the easiest way from a programmer's perspective to update is to just take the object, um, modified, here I'm adding an exclamation point to the body, so I'm really excited that I wrote something. Um, I'm going to mark the, uh, the post as edited, and if you'll note, that field didn't exist originally. Um, and then I'm just going to go ahead and save it. Um, <clears throat> and I will retrieve it back again just to show you what it looks like from the database, and print it. So as you can see, just as expected, um, I now have an exclamation point and um, it's been edited. Hopefully, this has been fairly straightforward. Um, now, one, one interesting thing about save is that what it will do is it will do a insert and setting an ID if you don't already have an ID on the object. It will just go ahead and insert it. Um, if you do have an ID, it will update the document at that place. So um, it kind of will just do a, a, a replacement. Um, so you don't have to worry about whether the object's already there. It will just replace it if it exists or not. So, um, moving on, getting more interesting. Um, hopefully that was all pretty simple. Um, it wouldn't really be a good blog if I didn't support comments, so I'm going to go ahead and add those now. Um, <clears throat> so here, what I'm doing is I'm creating a comment object. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give it an ID. Um, since it's going to be a sub-object, it doesn't technically need an ID, but it'll be nice when I want to refer to this specific comment uh, later. Um, this is a comment by Richard, and it's telling me that I should write more. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and update the post um, where ID has the post ID. So the way updates work is the first, um, the first, met, uh, the first parameter is a query, and the second parameter is a set of operations to perform. So here I'm going to push onto the comments array this comment object, and I will increment n comments by one. Um, <clears throat> so um, one thing to note, whenever you put multiple statements, uh, multiple update operations onto a single um, update statement, it will actually guarantee that those will be done atomically. So you're guaranteed that um, the, uh, the number of comments will always match the size of the comments array, uh, assuming that you always uh, do these operations together. Um, so now I will reply to his comment. Um, if you'll note, this field actually has an extra, this comment actually has an extra field um, of in reply to, and that can be used um, in the presentation layer to um, perhaps put a link in there, maybe show it as nested, however you want. Um, the main point is that these objects don't actually have to have the same exact fields. You can put whatever you want there. Um, in general, you want to keep some of the fields the same, like um, fields that do the same thing, like by and text. You don't want to just throw random garbage in your database. That's never a good idea, even if you're using a schemaless database. 
Um, there's a saying, garbage in, garbage out. You don't want to put garbage in your database because you're going to get garbage back out. So you want to try to be sane, um, but you do have the flexibility um, to have fields existing in some records and not existing in others. So here I'm just going to do the same thing. I'm going to push the reply on. Um, but now I'll show you uh, one of the, the interesting bits of our query. Um, you can actually query into these sub-documents. So if I flip back, I'll show you what this document looks like. Um, you can see that it now has this comments array, and it has end comments equals to, pretty much what you'd expect. But the nice thing is, I can do this query for comments.byRichard. And what that will do is it will actually um, enter into the array and traverse it looking for any field that matches where the by field equals Richard. And it will actually uh, check each of the elements in the array, which is typically what you'd want in a case like this. So this is where, in a traditional relational database, you might do a one-to-many join. Um, and then you might even go do uh, an extra layer where you have two layers of one-to-many, where you have uh, you're joining your users table up against your um, comments table, which you're then joining again with your post table to actually show a page. Here, I just have one collection with one object. Um, obviously, if this was a real blog, I'd have multiple posts, but each post would be self-contained within a single object um, that I can still do these type of rich queries on to find <coughs> um, posts by commenting user. So, scrolling down a little bit, um, I'll do a little bit more. Um, let's say that Richard was to edit his post. Um, one thing that you can now do is, um, here in the query, I'm looking for where the uh, comment ID equals the uh, Richard's comment ID. So this assumes that he uh, went to the blog again and hit the edit button and wanted to change his comment. So um, <clears throat> here I set, uh, I, I use this uh, dollar, which says take the matched, um, the matched position in the array. So here um, I'm matching to a, a field in the array. And this says take the, um, the text field of the matched element in the comments array and set, and set it to uh, you shouldn't write more. Um, and then I'm going to pull my comment. So I've decided maybe I shouldn't write more, and I'll go ahead and remove my comment. Um, and one nice thing, um, occasionally we'll get asked, so you've got an increment operator, why don't you have a decrement operator? And the answer is we don't need one. You can just increment by a negative number. Um, you can actually increment by any number you want, but um, every so often we get that question. So I'd, I'd contend that we wouldn't really be, let me scroll down a touch, we wouldn't really be a real database if we didn't actually support indexes. Um, we might be a key value store or, or something else, but you know, I think to be a database you actually have to be able to query and, and you know, retrieve your data, um, hopefully efficiently. So um, one nice thing that you can do is put an index on uh, not just top-level fields, and um, you can actually index into nested fields and nested fields in arrays. And one cool thing that this buys you is that if you think about it, in a relational database, you basically have a one-to-one -one mapping between row and entry in the index. So each row can only have one entry in the index. Uh, if your database supports sparse indexes, it may be either one or zero entries in the index, but you can't really have two entries in the index in a typical relational database. Um, one nice thing with the Mongo indexing system is that what it'll actually do is whenever you index a field that's an array, it will actually index each element in the array and put it into the index. So you actually get this kind of fan out behavior into the index. So this one post would have a, um, uh, an, an entry for Richard, and if I hadn't removed my comment, it would still have an entry for Matthias. And these indexes, um, as you would expect in a database, 
um, will be kept up to date whenever you update, whenever you insert, whenever you remove. We keep the indexes constantly um, and synchronously up to date. So here I'm just doing, um, I'm fetching um, comments by me. Um, as you would expect, um, since I removed my comment, that's going to return null. And here I'm fetching comments.by Richard. <clears throat> and um, one nice thing that you can do is I could take this query. Hopefully. And I could actually explain it. Dot x explain. And this will actually show you how we're going to execute the query. Um, so you can see that we're actually going to use a B-tree cursor if I didn't have this index. So let's say I just were to say comments.txt and search for that. You can see that it's using a basic cursor. So you, know, you actually get insight into what the database is doing. Um, and you could even do more interesting queries, like um, find me all comments by users whose name starts with rich. And you can see that we will actually able to use the index for that as well. Um, same as with a relational database, you would expect to be able to do a, um, if you did a query where um, this would be a comment by uh, <clears throat> like uh, rich, amp uh, I think it's a percent symbol is what they use in SQL. I don't know why, but um, we just use typical regular expressions because Hopefully most people know them. Anybody here not ever used regular expression? Excellent. You guys are advanced. All right. So um, another thing that most blogs typically have is tags. Um, so luckily those are extremely easy to implement. As you can see, what I'm doing here is I'm adding short, sweet, and stupid. Um, this is an array. and uh, doing a for each over it uh, with a function. And this is just JavaScript. One of the, uh, the nice things is that we're actually using JavaScript in the shell, so you actually have a real programming language to work with. So here what I'm doing is I'm updating the post and adding, uh, adding the tag. And then I'm going to update the tags collection uh, with the object id tag and increment its count. And I'm going to do what is called an upsert. And as the name implies, this is insert or update. So what it will do is it will search for an object with id equals tag. If it doesn't find one, it will insert the query, the query object. And then it will apply the update. So what will happen is it will cre create this object. Um, now, because I've added these tags, I can now do a find one. So find me a stupid post. If I scroll up, you'll see. Do, 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 do. So here I'm finding it. You can see that I now have my tags array. Um, additionally, um, <clears throat> I can iterate over all of the tags in the uh, tags collection. And <clears throat> you can see that they each have a count. Now, this is useful for things like um, creating a real-time tag cloud. Um, you don't actually have to um, do any sort of map reduce for that. You can just keep, um, do, keep a real-time count for all of your tags. Now, if you really wanted to, you could use map reduce. And actually, in our next release, we'll be adding something where you don't even have to write map reduce code, that you can do a declarative, um, a declarative syntax to uh, specify your, your groupings and your aggregations, and it will get um, you know, parallelized automatically and distributed across the cluster and all that fun stuff. Um, but for now, um, if you wanted to, if you weren't keeping these counts as you went, you would uh, need to actually write MapReduce. All right. Um, <clears throat> so just a final uh, bit. Um, a couple of interesting queries that you can do with um, arrays. 
Um, you can actually do an in query. So this is similar to in in SQL, where you specify an array, and it's basically saying uh, this field matches either of these. Now with an array, it's saying any of the elements in this array match any of the elements in the query array. Um, with, uh, with an array, you can also use the $all operator, um, which is saying both of these queries match. So <clears throat> this is a, a kind of equivalent to an or, and this is a kind of equivalent to an and. So as you would expect, um, this post does count for in smart and stupid. It doesn't count for all, um, but it does count for all of short and stupid. So there's, <clears throat> uh, there's the three outputs. All right. Um, I will show a little bit for uh, any uh, ops guys that are in the audience, all two of you. Um, so the way that we do our replication is actually writing to a collection called uh, the, it's in the local database which we use for replication. And the nice thing with the local database is it doesn't get replicated itself, which you don't want your replication data getting replicated because that would just be very confusing and screw things up. So local database is where you put things that don't get replicated. Um, and then what we do is we just insert um, these records which are then pulled from, um, the slave will just connect to this database and start pulling these records down and applying them. Um, one nice thing about it is that it's not exactly um, statement-based and it's not exactly um, binary replication, the, the, the two options that are common in SQL databases. Um, they both have problems. Um, we've decided to go with kind of a mixture of the two where when you do an update, um, if you'll note, if, you're, if you remember, what I was doing was I was uh, incrementing the comments field. But instead of storing an increment, because that allows things to get out of sync, um, we're instead, what we're doing is we're converting it to a set with the goal of being idempotent. So you can actually replay the op log multiple times. As long as you replay it in order, um, you're guaranteed to get the same results in the end. Um, so it, it kind of, no matter what state you're in, you're guaranteed to approach consistency using the op log. Um, whereas with, um, with uh, statement-based replication, it's far too easy to get out of sync. So, you know, doing things like set time to now. Well, now may be different on both of your servers, and then you've got problems. So, or even better, auto-incrementing IDs. When those get out of sync, you're really screwed, because then all your relations are screwed. So we try to avoid things like that. Um, we want replication to guarantee that you'll get the exact same results. Let's see, I think I've got about 15 minutes left, so um, let's see. I think I'll do some geo queries. Is anybody here working with geo data, uh, trying to find locations near? So a handful of people, more people raising their hands now. Okay, cool. So um, <clears throat> first I'm gonna import uh, a JSON file uh, using this handy run program thing again. Um, we ship, with the database, we ship a tool called Mongo Import. And what it does is it takes um, a file with one JSON object per line and just inserts it into the database. So here, I'm inserting the zips.json file into the database geo with the <clears throat> uh, collection of zips, and I'm going to uh, drop it. So the idea with drop is that it makes sure that you end up um, with only the files that, only the objects that were in the, um, in that collection, uh, in, in that file. Um, by default, it will just add to your um, database, which is what you want in some cases, actually. Um, so anyway, let me go ahead and add this. So import zips. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, you can do regular expression queries. Um, you can do exact queries. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that you can do ranges. Um, so this is saying greater than or equal to this string, less than this string. Also, you can do that with uh, numbers. Um, <clears throat> you can also uh, do sorting, uh, limiting, you can do skips. A lot of the, the, the types of queries that you're expecting to be able to do with a database, you can still do. Um, we, we try to avoid giving up features. The only, the only two main features that you won't be able to use from a relational database are joins 
and uh, transactions because those are hard to distribute over multiple systems. Um, you have to give up a lot of things, either make it really, really slow because you have to synchronously commit everywhere, um, which is too slow for most practical applications, um, or you have to give up consistency or give up various other uh, desirable properties. So we decided we're just not going to support transactions and we're not going to support joins. Um, and instead, we're going to support a richer data model that hopefully will make it so that you don't need these extra features, that you can add things together and put more things into a single row, which is guaranteed to be updated atomically. So now for the interesting part is actually doing geo-queries. So, <clears throat> um, if you're not familiar with the term um, zip code, uh, it's the, the US form of postcode. Um, but anyway, um, what I'm doing here is I'm going to go and build a geo index, and it's quite simple. Um, ensure index is how we, we build our, our indexes, and here what I'm doing is I'm building an index on location, which is a 2D index. Um, any sort of string uh, in an index field uses a special uh, index plugin, um, and I'm going to go ahead and add the state information to the index. So here I'm just doing a simple lookup for um, a single zip code, and this is, um, this is actually the zip code of Tengen headquarters. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to go ahead and show the location. Uh, this is the, uh, the actual latitude longitude of that zip code. So now what I can do is I can find um, where location is near our location. And specifically, I'm finding the five closest <coughs> excuse me. Specifically, I'm finding the five closest zip codes to our location. So that's, you know, extremely simple. Um, these are the five closest, as you'd expect, they're all in New York. Um, there's a lot of zip codes in New York, actually. Um, so the other thing you can do is use this geo near command. Um, so doing find with near will return the objects exactly as they are. Um, using geo near actually has some nice properties in that it will include some extra information like the distance um, and a little bit of debugging information um, that's mostly useful um, if you're working on the geo indexing. But um, <clears throat> what, what's really nice is that you can actually do uh, spherical queries as of version 1.8. So the difference is, by default, the, the geo queries assume a flat Earth. And I don't know if you've looked around in the last you know, couple hundred years, but we realize the Earth isn't quite flat anymore. So um, while a flat Earth is actually um, a good model to use for things like board games, and in fact, um, there's a website called Scrabbly that uh, won, uh, I think it was Node.js Knockout, um, that's actually using the geo queries to do a 2D search on a board game where they actually do want to use a flat, flat earth model to say, you know, give me all points in this, uh, in this region. Um, if you're actually doing points on the earth, um, you probably want to use, assume that the earth is round. So um, this will actually uh, uh, do the proper calculations, the trigonometry to uh, actually do the right thing, basically. And you can also add this little distance multiplier. By default, our, um, all the results will assume distance in radians. That way we're not, we didn't want to pick favorites in miles versus kilometers, so we decided to go with radians, which everyone can complain about. Um, <laughs> the nice thing with radians is that basically all you have to do um, to make them useful is multiply by the radius in the, of the Earth in you know, whatever unit you want, kilometers, um, feet, angstroms, whatever you want. So here, um, this is actually the um, number of kilometers that's the radius of the Earth. Um, if you actually want to do something interesting, you can actually, um, hopefully I actually have internet, but um, you can Google for radius of the Earth in km. And, you know, Google's nice and helpful like that. Um, if you, you know, want to show it in feet, can do that. It's a lot of feet. Um, but 
I can never remember the actual number, so I always have to Google it whenever I enter it. Anyway, so um, <clears throat> as you can see, um, this is the output. So this zip code is about almost one kilometer. This one's a little closer to one. This one's a little over one, so on and so forth. So this you could actually use to just go ahead and run the GeoNear query, show all bars near me, um, and uh, actually put a useful distance. We don't currently put a direction in there, but you know, if anybody actually wants that, we could probably hack it in if, if there's much demand. Um, <clears throat> finally, there's a few other uh, nifty bits. Um, you can query for within a box, um, and obviously that one kind of has to assume essentially flat Earth because you, the, the, the rectangles that you would use are always rectangular, so it doesn't actually matter whether you're using flat or round Earth. Um, here you can do um, within, a, uh, within a circle, so this is saying a center at our location with a radius of uh, 0.5. Um, <clears throat> and I could also do the same query, but tack on a little extra querying. So find me everything that's within uh, 0.5 of our location, but not in New Jersey, because New Jersey sucks. So. Um, I don't want to go there. So uh, this will show me uh, everything uh, in New York, basically. <clears throat> so I got a few optional bits here. Um, I could do a quick sharding demo, if anybody's interested in that. Um, I could show how you could use find and modify to do auto increment. I could go through some map reduces, or I could just open up the question. So holler out what you want me to do. Sharding. Anybody don't want sharding? Okay, sharding it is. So um, hopefully this will work. Um, you know, always live demos are interesting for that. So I like to set my hopes low, um, and the we'll we'll see what happens. So anyway, um, let me go ahead and clear out my uh, data directory because I have a small hard drive. And I will start up a little script that I have. And if you just Google for sharding simple setup, um, this is all on GitHub, so you can just run this script. And it's a good way to get like kind of a feel for sharding, what it can, what it can't do, all that kind of stuff. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start with a few parameters. Um, path equals USR bin. Um, by default, it'll actually use the uh, Mongo in my home directory, which is the development version. And I'm not quite brave enough to do a live demo on the development version. Um, <clears throat> also, I will set a chunk size. Of um, 10 megabytes. So it goes ahead and fires up all the servers that are needed. Um, obviously, it'll run them on localhost um, because uh, I only have one computer right here. Um, but it'll do the same thing. It'll still communicate over TCP IP and all that stuff. Um, so what actually gets run is one config server, which is what stores all the data, uh, all of the uh, metadata, such as where, where all of your data is, uh, what the host names are, all that kind of stuff. Um, it'll also start up three shards, which are where your data actually sits. And then it will start up a MongoS router, which is what handles uh, your queries. That's what you will connect to directly. And the nice thing is the MongoS actually speaks the same protocol as the MongoD. So your application doesn't actually need to know that it's connected to a sharded setup. You just tell it to connect to localhost and some port and it will go on its merry way, acting as if it was talking to a normal database. But behind the scenes, MongoS is going to take those queries, and it's going to route them out to many different hosts. Um, that's the, the, the whole point of sharding. And we want it to be as seamless as possible. So um, <clears throat> I've got a little function down here called mega insert. Let me bring this up a little bit so you can see. Um, what it does is it just takes a big string, um, fills it out to um, one kilobyte. So I now have a one kilobyte string. Um, and then it inserts 
into the foo collection, which my script will go ahead and shard by uh, ID, uh, the big string. So that way I don't have to type this all out. Uh, since I bounced the server, um, it, it needed to reconnect. Um, <clears throat> so it just inserted 100,000 records into the three servers. So if I run print sharding status, um, this is designed for uh, larger screens with smaller fonts. So it's wrapping a little bit, but um, I can go ahead and explain what, what all this stuff is. <clears throat> Hopefully. Um, <clears throat> Five minutes. Um, <clears throat> hmm. Fun with live demos. Um, so I think I started this with the wrong parameter. Let's try this one more time. That's better. Ah, I know what the problem is. It's using the wrong database. There we go. That's better. So, as you can see, all this activity in the back. Um, I was inserting into a non-charted database. Um, so by default, this script will shard the test.foo collection on ID and test.bar on a field called key. Um, so what you do is you just say, shard on this field. Um, <clears throat> and now, if I print sharding status, um, you can see that right now it's distributed, uh, not perfectly. Um, it's split it up so that there's nine chunks on shard two, three chunks on shard one, and ten chunks on shard ten on shard zero. Now if I run it again, you'll see that it's going to go ahead and start evening things out. And if we wait uh, once every 15 seconds, it'll actually move one chunk. We don't want to overwhelm the system by moving too much, too fast, but we do want to get back to a, as you can see, now we're pretty evenly distributed. We now have uh, seven chunks on two of them and eight on one. We can't really get any more uh, evenly distributed than that. So um, to actually see what these chunks look like, Um, basically, they're just ranges. So um, what we do is we do range-based sharding, which means that um, we'll, we'll split up the data into what we call chunks, which are each going to be between 32 and 64 megs um, by default. I set it to 10 as the cap just for demo purposes. But once they hit 64 megs, what we'll do is we'll cut them in half uh, at the median value, so you get two 32 meg chunks. And then once each of those grows, uh, we'll cut them in half and so on and so forth. So the, the idea is that you don't need to know your distribution. You don't even need, you don't need an even distribution. You don't need to know it ahead of time. Um, if things grow unevenly, that's fine. We can just split it however uh, you need them to, to be distributed. Um, and then what we can do is we can move these chunks around. Because they're only 32 to 64 megs, you know, on a gigabit length, that can be transferred pretty quickly. So we, didn't want them, we don't want to have to rebalance everything, like when you restripe a, a RAID 0 um, or a RAID 5, we want to just be able to move um, essentially proportional to the amount of data uh, that you're imbalanced. So when you add a new host, if you have 10 hosts um, and you add another host, each host is going to contribute one-tenth of its data. Um, so actually, as you add more servers, whereas with um, you know, more naive sharding patterns, 
you end up having to move more data as you add hosts. With, um, with, with this type of sharding, you actually end up having to move less data per shard. Um, so that was one of our goals. So as you can see, it will split up your data. It will evenly distribute it without you really having to think. As you can see, I didn't have to write anything special. I'm just inserting into the collection. Um, so I don't want to keep you guys from lunch. So if you have any questions, I'm going to be here all day and tomorrow. And we actually have a booth downstairs. So if you guys want any stickers or uh, uh, any, any of our swag, please stop by our booth. So thank you. <laughs>